The story of Australia's first peoples is the oldest continuing human story on Earth. This podcast series presents a collection of first peoples' voices, sharing their experiences, achievements, hopes and beliefs. These are the real stories of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australia. Hi, I'm Mary Sonta and you're listening to The Real Podcast Series. In this episode, I'm chatting with writer and poet Ellen Van Nieuwen. I think I've pronounced that correctly. I'm getting a thumbs up. One thing you've just mentioned off um, mic before we got on is just how much smarter you are than the rest of us when you book travel that you try and fly in the middle of the day because it's less like being a part of this big, massive machine. I don't know if it's smart more than just like I'm a bit precious, but like I definitely prefer to fly during the day, like no crowds, um, just feeling a bit more like a person who has some personal space and not part of this, (laughs) like I told you, machine of like, yeah, sort of flying can feel a little bit I don't know, like you're just hopping on a bus these days. It can feel so, like, ordinary. But um, I just think, um, like, when, like, for my, pe- like, parents' generation, like, how, like, like special it was to fly and they, like, got up, got all, like, dressed up and everything to go on the plane and stuff. So, um, yeah, for me it's, like, a big deal. Um, I'm, I'm not too good with travel because it's, like, it's artificial it's like you're moving too fast and I like to sort of do a few sort of grounding steps before I go to uh, someone else's country and and sort of try and yeah sort of feel my way through that and that's what I love about talking to you already that you're just so observant um, of your surroundings and pace of life and I suppose that's part of being a writer Mm, yeah I think so I think uh Writers are like, yeah, really in their their heads, hey, um, and so yeah, that was that's always been the way that I sort of like look look at the world. Yeah, with just too many too many thoughts, maybe. <laughs> and what are some of those grounding steps that you do to kind of um, acknowledge being on country? Yeah, well, when I was you know coming here now on, on Gadigal country, um, I was outside your studio and. Um, there's a beautiful um, paperback tree just outside um, and I could hear this, uh, you know, really annoying noise and <laughs> I looked above me and I could see um, one of those noisy minor birds um, sort of like pecking at the tree and I just sort of like watched this this little guy for a little while, um, like watching him sort of make his mark on the tree um and it was just through that like really like little moment where I was like okay I'm I'm here I'm in this place I've been here before I know the smell of this place um I know the taste of this place um and um I know that my ancestors are here with me as I made that travel um to yeah to to make sure that I have safety in that that space so yeah And that's one thing we definitely get from reading your work that um, not only observation but that love of country and that talking about um, connection and being aware of and we're in a busy world these days where you could totally actually have never noticed the the tree out the front of our office and we've been here for three years (laughs) and I will not walk past it in the future and not notice it and look up for a bird. So thank you for that reminder. But how important is it to stop and be um, aware and grateful, do you think? Yeah, I think it can like help heaps in this like condition that we're living in that's like so busy, so fast paced um, and so like capitalist, I guess. Um, and yeah, thinking of a city like Sydney, this this beautiful place, um, uh, this, yeah, this country is, is really strong and um if we all sort of acknowledge uh, the whose mob whose mob's land that we're that we're on, um, and gain a little bit more knowledge of of that mob that and and their their love for the land, then you know we can sort of just bring that into our everyday lives really easily. I think. 
And thank you for helping us to do that through your writing. Can you tell us a little bit about your mob and where you're from? Yeah, I'm a very proud Malanjali person from the Yugumbe language group, um, which is, uh, you know, south of Brisbane, um, Scenic Rim, Gold Coast, uh, the sort of just just getting onto the border of New South Wales. Um, beautiful country, if I may say, but I'm, of course I'm biased. Um, we've got the mountains, the sea, uh, the rivers, uh, Mullinjali countries between the Logan and Albert rivers. And uh, yeah, the border ranges of New South Wales and Queensland. And we've got what my cousin calls um, dark soil, black soil country um, because of um, the volcano. Um, so, you know, we have this like really uh, fertile soil and it's a really um, important like biodiverse area. Um, and I grew up in southeast Queensland, so I've never been too far away from country and um, from family. And it's something that I feel uh, really... Um, privilege to have had um, and uh, that's on my mother's side so my mum both of her parents are Aboriginal and then my dad is Dutch and my dad um, migrated here um, in the early 90s um, so having a you know really big Aboriginal family and a really big Dutch family um, has just been yeah just been part of who I am and have both sides of the family ever had a reunion? Yeah, well, what's really beautiful is um, my grandmothers got to meet each other. Like, how special is that? Um, so my Oma, or my dad's mum, she's she was quite elderly, um, but she decided that she, you know, she'd never been on an aeroplane before, but she wanted to meet her grandchildren. Um, and she even started, like taking English lessons and stuff so she could like communicate and um yeah so she yeah she'd never been on a plane before and like my dad just didn't know how she was gonna go so um yeah she they took her to the doctor and and she got some Valium and apparently she just went was like straight out <laughs> and, <laughs> and came yeah came here um to a whole nother country and um, this was, yeah, this was when I was, I guess, maybe eight, eight years old and my brother was five and um, uh, we invited my nana, my mum's mum, over and I just remember my two grandmothers sitting um, on our back deck um, looking at the bush behind us and um, I don't, they probably couldn't really like talk much but... Well, like not in like verbally, but just like, yeah, it was just a really beautiful moment that I'm really glad that I got to like witness, I guess. Yeah, um, both both of my grandmothers are past now. Actually, all my grandparents are. Um, and that's what life's all about, isn't it? Having those kind of moments in your memory where you kind of go, that was special. And, and also one of those that as you get older, you kind of appreciate more and more. Yeah, yeah, it's epic and um, I'm really glad that my mum like reminds me of things like when I start to forget she'll will like have a yarn about Nana and she'll like tell me all these like funny things Nana used to say or like these like one-liners or whatever and um, in that way like I keep like remembering and it keeps sort of staying present um, and as you get older, your sort of perspective shifts, I guess, and it becomes like even more important to like hold on to those memories. And what was it like growing up in southeast Queensland? Oh, yeah, I love it. I love, I love the weather. I love the humidity. Um, I love, um, yeah, the, the water. Um, I love, yeah, just the air and everything and, um, and also, I guess, just how sporty it is because I'm, like, pretty sporty <laughs> myself. Um, so, yeah, and these things you sort of learn because I spent two years in Melbourne, so the contrast was really clear and I got to sort of learn about the things that I appreciated about home and, and then also, also the new things 
that I was appreciating when um, living on the land of the Kulin Nation in Nam or Melbourne. So, yeah. Was there a moment when you knew that writing was exactly what you wanted to do with your life? Oh, that's a good question. I think I was pretty young, hey, that writing sort of came to me. Um, I, because my mum, she like keeps things, oh, bless her. She's She had this little um, thing that I had, you know, drawn in school and it was like what do you want to be when you grow up and I'd written a writer and I think you know I think I was like five or something so um yeah really young um I just really loved reading um as a kid and yeah mum would just like put a book in front of me and I would just be totally engrossed in um yeah in, in in writing and 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 then sort of had my own stories in my head from yeah from pretty young I guess. Um, that's so special to know at that age and then to have kind of rolled out exactly what you wanted to be. I think that's increasingly rare. But to actually be talented at what you thought you wanted to do at five is another thing again. Um, what do you find most challenging about writing? Mm, yeah, um, I find it really overwhelming because. There's a lot of things that I want to write about. Um, I feel like there's so much like injustice in this country and I wish that poetry and writing were ways to like combat that just injustice or to heal. And um, I'm not sure if it can ever be enough. So I just do the little bits that I can and try not to let um, I guess all of the things that I see around me overwhelm me. Um, would you ever write for a play or a film, movie, so to bring kind of your words to life a little bit more in, in, in you kind of saying that you wish that it was more than just words for injustice? Mm. Are there other avenues of storytelling that you would want to potentially explore? Yeah, I think like drama and film are really powerful modes of storytelling and it's definitely something that I've been sort of playing around with recently. Oh, was that like, a teaser? Yeah. A little? I have to sort of keep you in the loop. <gasps> well, that's exciting. Maybe we could do a follow-up podcast Maybe. when you're allowed to talk about it. Maybe. I don't even know what she's talking about yet, so <laughs> I don't know anything, everyone out there listening, thinking that I do. Um, but, yeah, when I kind of read, I go, I know this is good, but I just don't have it in me to know how you're that good or why this is there. Oh. It's just such a, a skill. Yeah. Um, and I know that you've been an editor as well. So um, how have you kind of grown in your craft over the years? Yeah, so um, when I was like a real young one, I just knew that I liked writing. I didn't know how or why or like what I wanted to write about. Um, I just sort of, yeah, I was, I would read stuff um, and I decided that I would, that I wanted to study writing at uni. Um, so I went to QUT um, and yeah, I just sort of ran into a, previous a lot QT yep. alumni. Jackie Cornforth yes. is in the office. Yes. Yes, I think we might have started the same year. Um so it was it was mad because there was an awesome bunch of us um at the Uduru Nunaku unit there at QT, you know, Aboriginal staff and students. Um and yeah, that's when I sort of started, oh who's this who's this Ani Uduru Nunaku person? Mm-hmm. You know, like who who are these people? Um, cause we didn't like learn about them at school, even though it would have been highly relevant and deadly and, and would have really, you know, helped, I think when I was a young person. Um, so I was like, cool. All right. Um, went to library, got out, um, Ani Ujiru's work, uh, Uncle Lionel Fogarty, uh, Samuel Wagon Watson, Lisa Blair, uh, these Aboriginal writers that I didn't know about no one sort of had ever pointed me in that direction um and I just yeah I just had you know goosebumps you know I was like wow here's like the black voice on the white page you know something that was just sort of married everything that I'd been feeling and thinking and been confused about um because I'd yeah literally never read anything that was like authored by us before 
Um, and I was like sick. Um, and it really helped me I develop, I guess, what, you know, you say in creative writing school, you like your voice. Like um, I had a voice and I knew that it was like of a young, um, a young Murray um, sort of living in South East Queensland and yeah, writing about family and country and sexuality, desire, love, uh, all these things. And that sort of started um, coming together really sort of late in my degree, um, maybe sort of just the last few weeks. I finally wrote something that I was proud of um, because, you know, it was still pretty whitewashed. You know, we were getting told that we had to write a certain way and um, that a lot of people, yeah, and there was no other, even though I had the strong core people at the Uju unit, there was no other Aboriginal students in my creative writing degree. So, yeah, I was sort of um, a little bit like, I just need to follow the group and do whatever they're doing. But, you know, suddenly I sort of had an idea of like another way, another way, another method, another approach um a sort of stronger way that I could reclaim who I was um and write myself on the page and I was like deadly and I just sort of started that um then I got aware of uh, an opportunity that a project was starting up at the State Library of Queensland um just great timing uh just when I was finishing my degree um I also got a, um, a traineeship with government and I was um, doing, you know, comm stuff for them, um, uh, which was sort of a, a secure, you know, a secure environment to be in financially um, with a pathway. Um, but then this sort of project was coming out of left field, but it was ticking all the boxes, you know, Aboriginal writing, editing, oh, cool, what's this? Um, so I went with, with that mob and I became um, one of the inaugural um, trainee edit black and white trainee editors. Um, this was 20, 2011 um, and it was myself and um, uh, Ani... Annie, who's just recently passed away this this year, sadly, um, and she was, she her her parents were really good friends with my grandparents, um, which is a really nice connection. Um, and she's from the Bunjalung and Butchala mobs, um, and uh, yeah, we we got on really well, and we we started this two year. Um, course basically where we started to learn how to be an editor or more specifically a black editor you know what does that mean like what what does do that we, mean what do we how bring? is that different yeah yeah what do we bring like what's those nuances what's that sort of those knowing those implications of language like how are the ways that we work with each other different you know like establishing that like rapport that sort of goes beyond like sending someone an email but like actually like properly yarning with them and getting to know them and sort of working yeah that sort of black collaboration um so yeah it was it was an incredibly exciting time for me as a young person to be part of the first writer that I got to work with is a multi-award winning Ali Kobe Ekerman um who's an incredible writer and sitting down with Ali and sitting down with her work was just such a great experience for me as a young person and all the other writers that we got to work with that were from all over the country, all obviously older than me, you know, me being like a very young person of 20 years old. Um, and so it was fantastic. And again, like reading that mob um, at the library, sitting down in the library, reading Lisa Belair and crying, working with these mob um, and seeing that they had put their stories on paper just somehow was the most thrilling and affirming thing that I needed to, you know, to be where I am now as like 
someone who feels confident enough to write and to publish my work. Um, so yeah, it was. I'm getting all emotional thinking about it, but yeah, um, I think um, in terms of like how that experience has helped my writing, I think I have really sort of high standards of like knowing that um, I want to like push my work and um, I know I know the sort of space that I'm writing into. I know that there's all this other mob that are doing amazing things and I want to make a contrib com contribution that can be part of like this whole thing of, of like blacking it up and like talking back to whiteness and sort of uh, yeah, sort of keeping our stories safe in this, I guess, quite precarious publishing industry. Lots of things to take on from the, just that little story about your time at Black and Right. Mm. But yeah, I can just feel it. I wish everyone could see you telling that story because yeah, it, um, I'm a bit kind of lost hearing, but I can totally relate to those safe spaces um, and coming up against structures, particularly universities, one of the big ones, mm -hmm. um, that is very Western in style. And so it's lovely having Indigenous units within universities that creates that space. But then, like you say, you're often the only Aboriginal student in whatever course you're in. So you really have to have that courage and voice within you to go, no, I'm going to back myself. I'm actually going to go this way because this feels more right to me. Um, so that, I think that's really strong kind of takeaway from that story and just your kind of journey in life so far. Um, now, you were 23 when you first wrote your, well, when you wrote the first novel, Heat and Light, which won and was shortlisted for several major literary awards. I don't know how you would feel <laughs> at 23 to write a novel and then have it be so successful. Um, how did the concept of the work develop for you and what did you kind of set out to achieve when you started that? Yeah, it was mad. I think um, a bit of like the determination of you, Faye, like just really going for it. Um, yeah, so it was, I was in my early 20s and I wrote a little bit at the la my last few weeks of uni of something that I thought, oh, there might be something here, hey. Um, and that was a piece that that's actually appears towards the end of Heat and Light um, that's about two uh, young Murray women um, who um, sort of come from different walks of life. Um, so the story's called S and J and there's about two characters, one called S and one called J, um, who come from two different walks of life um, and it's about how they're sort of seen differently because they have, uh, you know, different coloured skin and one looks more stereotypically Aboriginal than the other so um yeah that was the first piece that I wrote that I thought oh yeah this is sort of um I'm happy with this um and so I realized that my work was going in three different directions firstly I really wanted to um tell the sort of a family story about um Malanjali, Yugambeh country, which connects to Bundjalung country, um, and, and talk about, um, I guess, the sort of, um, what do you call it, um, the, how the policy, the past policies have impacted on um, us and, uh, and then, you know, in turn impact on, I guess, fam families and sort of, and I guess like how, how do you make your like way back from that and how can the sort of like the knowing and knowing the sort of strong, strong ancestors that you have in your family, how can that influence you in the present? So I wanted to tell this story about um, fam a family story that was also told by uh, different people from the one family. So it wasn't just one perspective. Mm -hmm. And then I wanted to tell this story that was real a bit wild hey like a like futuristic story about uh yes a story set in the near future that was like really satirical um and uh also about southeast queensland and thinking about um past and current policies that 
isolated people on islands and what that looks like in sort of a futuristic story about these these creatures that are ancestor beings that have come back to country to sort of warn about what's sort of happening to the environment and to the country. Um, and that was really fun to write because I was also thinking about what would Australia be like as a republic. Um, it was understanding that as we move forward as a country and we're answering some important questions about treaty and uh, um, constitutional recognition, um, you know, that with, there's, there's no perfect answer, there's no perfect solutions uh, and... Um, thinking about, you know, what's important in those questions and knowing that we can never fully trust um, an authority of power unless, you know, we are in control, um, that we're all, always going to get let down, you know, as you can see with the native title, um, that we'll, we're still, we still don't own our land. We still don't, you know, there's, there's conditions. It's everything is conditional. Um, so thinking about that through a futuristic story and then um, the last part of the book is those stories about being young, uh, being queer, being Murray um, and that's where that first story appears in the, la in the later section. Um, so it's, I guess like three, those three threads that I wanted to follow um, and that's why Heat and Light has those three parts. It would be fun to imagine, like as a writer, I, I don't stop and think about things in a forward place, so I want to get inside your head a little bit more on this. Um, but yeah, just as a republic and the country, like because we're just constantly in a cycle, aren't we? The, the themes that you wrote about the, all those years ago are still exactly what we're talking about right now. So how do you imagine a place for us as a people um, that is positive and self-determined and, um, you know, what could the, it look like if we were in charge? So that must have been fun just to play in that space in your mind for a little bit. Yeah, it's, it was, I'm not going to lie, it was great. It was sort of, uh, yeah, it was a fun place. It was, <laughs> it was somewhere where I could really explore um, and it drags me out of my like just embedded cynicism with the world um, and, you know, just turning on the news and just seeing, yeah, just seeing things happen. They just, it's like a, like you said, it's just like a loop. Um, and so I really, it was really inspired by like indigenous futurisms, Afrofuturisms, like what, you know, as a sort of creative form, like if we imagine our future, then we can step into it, I guess. Um, so yeah, I'm really like, I guess, curious about that type of writing and art making. And water is a recurring motif um, in Heat and Light, but also in your other work. Is that deliberate? Why do you think that is? Mm, yeah, you know, it's just water's life. You know, we come from it. Uh, it's it's really just really important. And I will continue to write about our, our water stories and continue to write about a connection to water as a, a freshwater uh, river person. Um, and also the other interesting thing when kind of doing research on you is just how um, how much people give you these massive accolades, well <laughs> deserved, but also labels that are, you know, that you're one of the most important emerging Australian writers is just one of them. How comfortable are you with these types of statements and kind of titles thrown at you? Uh, not Not too comfortable, hey? Like, I think, um, yeah, actually, to be honest, um, when my my first book got so much success and, and so much praise, it sort of uh, stopped me from writing a little bit. Uh, just It was just, you know, it's a moment, but I think you can feel, yeah, you can feel overwhelmed and you can sort of start to, like, not trust your own instincts and be like, oh, nah, they're not, they can't be serious like yeah like it, it can really sort of mess with your head a little bit um so yeah I guess I sort of and then yeah and then you have the critics as well and I guess I sort of started to think about like moving forward like continuing to like 
you know, when you have the pressure of like writing for white Australia, black Australia, everyone in between, I was like, nah, look, just like, because then, yeah, you're you're stuck in these roles of like, um, you know, being an educator, being an entertainer, being, you know, being this, being that. I was like, nah, just like, what do you, what do you want to read? Like, what are you interested in? And just like, go with your heart, you know, like, knowing that I have family and friends that remain loyal and like back me like just yeah just don't sort of listen to everyone else and just sort of go for it so I'm in I'm in a great space now that I can you know continue to create and because I definitely don't take it for granted you know. And tell us about your writing process how do the ideas come about how do you decide that that's the idea I'm going to write about and um, that's the idea that I'm not going to write about or Mm. do you have multiple projects on the go at one time? I do have multiple projects. Uh, I take a lot of notes and I write a lot of lists. Um, so I'm always sort of scribbling down things in my, either in a notebook, I always have a notebook with me, um, or a phone. Um, and I usually assign different notebooks for different projects. Um, uh, but in sort of true reflection to how... Um, messy my head is you know these notebooks will also be filled with um shopping lists and love letters (laughs) and everything it'll just be like a real sort of yeah time bomb of that particular moment in my life um and so I I do a mixture of um I guess notebooking and um on my laptop um and it's uh it's also through talking to other people that I sort of gain an understanding of my motivations and like whether, you know, this is a good idea, whether this is something I can write about because like we have our own, we have, we have like ethical considerations as well, like uh, in terms of like, yeah, I think people think, um, yeah, as like Aboriginal or Torres Strait people, we're like immune to like ethics on what we can write about, but it's like, we're, I think we're even more responsible and we're even more conscious of what we can do and like how we might represent certain stories or certain, um, yeah, certain aspects. So, um, yeah, definitely having those those yarns as, as part of the journey and having those sort of, yeah, think, yeah thinking to myself about, um, yeah, what I want to do. And, um, but I think, yeah, whenever I get stuck... Uh, don't know if this like helps for you but I like go for a walk uh, I'll have a shower or I'll have a swim they're like the three things that seem to sort me out it's so good I wish I had three things that would sort me out <laughs> when I'm stuck <laughs> very good I'll try um, each of those um, it's tr- quite true about that pressure as an Aboriginal person in terms of representation Um, And so you're referring to ethics there, but just more broadly about because um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander stories aren't shared all that often in the mainstream and there aren't that many writers. I'm glad that it's all increasing, but your book might be the only book a non-Aboriginal person picks up and that's going to be their perception of an Aboriginal person or an experience. Um, So it's a very simple way to kind of demonstrate the point. But Oh, um, if I thought about that, I would never write again. (laughs) Don't think about it. (laughs) We'll move on to the next question because we want you to keep writing. (laughs) No, you're you're very true in that, sis, yeah. Um, So as you were mentioning, in Heat and Light, you've combined the three separate stories into one work. um, And it's obviously a short story approach. Why do you think um, they offer the author and the reader different, something different to novels, do you? And why are you choosing to um, – why did you to choose to do it in that style? Yeah, I think there's, like, more entry points, I guess, that you can sort of choose your own adventure and how you might want to approach the work. Um, and I know, you know, some some themes can be heavy and you maybe you're just not in the right mood for that day and you might want to, like, write a – read a lot lighter piece. So I think my work is, like – is has – offers those opportunities – for readers to read something in a different way and um, it sort of goes against the Eurocentric model of having like a a structure that's like has a clear beginning, middle and end because our stories are often circular, they move in different ways. Um, I might want to write a story that reflects how uh, 
the river moves, you know, like so it'll be in a different form. So, um, yeah, that's what I try and do in my writing is to experiment and try and find the right form that fits the story. So true. I want to, can we do a class sometime? I'd love to kind of learn more about those different styles. Um, Do you teach lots of different students or any classes? Yeah, I I guess they teach me more than anything, but yeah, I I like having... Yeah, I love I love um, uh, writing workshops or spaces to yeah to talk about writing like pe- from people from all walks of life. Hey, it's really cool to have like just a black only one. Like it's really deadly when it's just yeah, sort of you can talk. But I've also like had uh, done classes with like fifteen year olds and like they know more about writing than me. I'm like shame. <laughs> like you guys can lead the class or like yeah or like some. Yeah, I did one in Sydney last year that was like LGBTIQ elders, um, which was really beautiful. And they were like writing their life story. Yeah, it was was really sweet. Just that like it's part of like New South Wales Seniors Festival and partnering with um, Akon. um, And yeah, it was sort of just around just before Mardi Gras. And yeah, these people, I guess sort of between the ages of like 50 to 80 yeah they were they were yeah it was just really lovely to sort of have that inter intergenerational dialogue so I'm like I don't I don't know I can't think of like dating before the internet like t- tell me about that like yeah, it was, it's yeah it was really sweet yeah um were there any questions that they asked you as a younger person that stick to mind yeah I think um it's they were sort of talking about how, you know, there's lots of like different language now to talk about, um, I guess, like sexual preference or like gender identity. And we're sort of having a bit of a, a yarn about that, um, which is cool. Um, yeah, I think uh, language and like labels are like really interesting because I think it it sort of boils down to it that people don't like being in boxes. So yeah no matter like who you are so yeah we're having a a good chat about that yeah I imagine that would be a great chat um now you write both prose and poetry and have released a volume of poetry titled comfort food which made me hungry eat reading (laughs) it's good (laughs) I made a trip to the fridge it was meant to that's good good. (laughs) it did um from a creative perspective how do you go about walking that line between prose and poetry and what does working across both forms give to you um, as a writer? I thought the way that question was going, then you're going to ask me like, how do you go about writing and just like not eating everything in your <laughs> fridge at the same time? Well, you can answer that question too if you like. <laughs> Which is very hard because I definitely get the munchies when I'm writing. You know, you just want anything, you know, any sort of distraction, um, any sort of fuel. Um, I, yeah, really interesting. I think I sort of had to like decolonize my mind a little bit to like appreciate poetry um because poetry was like something that you know the the few times that we had it at school it was like really like you know dead white man like it was like (laughs) yeah it was like oh yeah it was so hey no it wasn't like I, I can appreciate it but it was just very narrow I guess like this is what poetry was oh people who wrote hundreds of years ago and like lived in Britain oh okay that's what that's what poetry is um so again I sort of had to yeah um wasn't my fault you know like it was yeah it was this yeah it was a school system and it was this you know thing but um once I sort of met the right people and had the right conversations and met the right books yeah I was reading this um this really exciting poetry from black fellas here but also like mob from the pacific and like african american and asian and um i was like cool um and native american and yeah you know my world was you know opened a little bit to be like why this very narrow western perspective when there's so many so much amazing writing that's actually more it feels more relevant to my life you know um and I was like cool cool so I like read a lot of that um and I was writing poetry but I just felt a bit sort of shame about it um whereas having done 
um, a degree that was really fiction focused actually. Uh, it was very, very fiction focused. We didn't really talk about many other genres. Um, I sort of had a slight confidence in my ability as a fiction writer, but I, I thought, yeah, I didn't, I didn't know if my poetry was any good basically. Um, and then it was just when I started sort of sharing it with a few people, oh, look, I've written this poem, like, <laughs> do you think it's all right? Um, uh, they were like, yeah, it's cool, yeah. Um, and I think, uh, you know, I had, so I had that permission, you know, from other mob, you know, you can write poetry, it's okay. <laughs> um, and then I needed a, an obsession and my obsession became around food and I was writing poems about food. I was like, I don't know why, but this is something that's, that's calling me. So um, I think it was because I was thinking about home and belonging and um, I was travelling and I was, yeah, also thinking about uh, the food that my ancestors had and like traditional food from our country um, which is why the the bunion art is this, you know on the front cover as sort of a central motif. Um, and I was yeah, just thinking about uh, family and and the times that we spent together when we're eating a meal and how precious that is. And once I was like, okay, I'm writing about you know this is going to be called comfort food. Um, it sort of opened the floodgates because then every time I had a meal. It could then be a poem. So it was just like when you just get on one of those things that's, that lasts um, a few months where poems just sort of keep pouring out of you. Um, so I was, yeah, really grateful for that inspiration and then that seemed to be a body of work that I wanted to go forward, uh, which then became, yeah, became a published book, my first published book of poetry. And it was so great to read because, like you, at school, you're just like, oh, it's this guy who's <laughs> been around for, you know, a bit tricky. But then to pick up and read a book that you like, who doesn't love food? And then as an Aboriginal person to read, you know, about finger limes and go, yeah, mm. I get this. This is familiar in a um, style of writing that you don't read that often. So it was kind of, yeah, it was very heartwarming to kind of um, bring it all together. But here you talk about it, it's even better. Now mm, I'm hungry cool. again. <laughs> <laughs> and my stomach's rumbling a little bit. <laughs> I have to get snacks for future podcasts, I think. Um, one of the one of the common threads that exists within Indigenous Australian writing, um, so what are some of the common threads that exist within Indigenous Australian writing and between Indigenous writers, do you think? So you've talked about mm. kind of the community of Indigenous writers that you're lucky enough to have been surrounded with quite early in your career and I imagine that you keep in touch with, with um, writing festivals and, you know, specifically black writers, events, etc. cetera. Um, so what do you think is unique about Indigenous writers? Yeah, uh, yeah, that's cool. That's a really cool question. And um, I, I, th I think I should have a handle on it because of how much, you know, black writing that I've read. Um, but still, you know, I don't want to, like, I guess ha have – I don't want to like prescribe, you know, this is this is the answer. Um, but I guess some of the common threads that, you know, like there was a there's a really strong uh, uh, women's memoir um, that has come out in the last 30 years, so Aboriginal women telling their life story this, that just are really incredible stories um, and really like, I guess, humanising us. Um, so, yeah, these, these memoirs about like, what it's like like living under the act or what it's like to sort of have to uh, really fight for your children. Um, yeah, just really uh, harrowing stories about what is just really recent history, I guess. Um, and so a lot of these stories are about family, culture, belonging, community. Um, and then, you know, we have uh, children's writing, we have fiction, we have poetry, we have writers starting to branch out into genre writing like science fiction, like Claire Coleman um, writing, yeah, sort of writing speculative uh, stories um, that really sort of can get people thinking. Um, I guess there's a lot of work about land, about country, about sort of thinking about um, the consequences of mining or interfering with the land 
um, about nuclear, the nuclear testing in SA. Like there's, there's a lot of work that's responding directly to um, colonisation and the, in- the increasing invasion of land and people. Um, and uh, yeah, there's just, I think there's just something for everyone. I think that's, I love how diverse Aboriginal writing are writing is I love how there's like some like young queer ones coming up as well um I love how uh the women's stories are so strong um but also of men and stories of uh I think some of the first um poetry um was written like men's writing was like written in prison so like thinking about how there's like yeah there's just so many um there's so much uh, that's pushed onto our lives and but there's so much beauty in the way that we push back, I think. Um, so, yeah, it's really, yeah, really diverse and I don't, I don't feel like I could fully say everything, but, yeah. No, that's, of course, you can't say mm. it all, but um, I think you did a really good job of giving us a snapshot and making us all want to go away and read some more. We might have to ask for your top 10 people to maybe read or something mm. to attach to the podcast just so um, we can get, you know, get that out to our the real listeners so they can dive a little bit more into um, black writing. And um, as part of the black writing community, um, what, how do you think that potentially impacts on your work or who have been potentially some of your major influences? Yeah, I just have to think like recently, I, I just uh, this year I read um, Uncle Tony Birch's new book, The White Girl, uh, which is a really deadly read. Um, I just have to think about Uncle Tony, how he's he's very prolific now. I think he's he's written about eight books now um, and how, like, all of them have been of such high quality and such, you know, su- such, like, I don't know, just really just beautiful language, uh, stories that just, like, break your heart but also like give you a hug at the end of it too Mm. um like he just sort of he's he's just says you know like I've got a contract with you reader I'm not going to kill any of my Aboriginal characters you don't have to worry so um yeah his his reading is his writing is really beautiful and I love reading him um and uh having him as a mentor having Ani Melissa Lukashenko as a mentor Annie Alexis Wright, um, too many people to name, Sister Natalie Harkin. Um, it's really great to sort of be part of this, to get, yeah, to be in this together with them. And I do have to have a shout out to uh, Sister Natalie's recent book as well, um, Archival Poetics, which is beautiful, and Annie Mel's book, which, uh, you know, won the Miles Franklin this year, um, Too Much Lip. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, really funny read. Um, it's just so, it's just so, just amazing and heartwarming to sort of see how um, black writing's being embraced and celebrated, um, and that there's there should be room for like all of us. And yeah. And so, what do you consider to be the role and the significance of Indigenous writing within the Australian cultural landscape? I think you could do a lot. I think if you think of like Uncle Bruce Pascoe's Dark Emu, just how um, that had a massive influence in the white Australian psyche where they started to think about, oh, yeah, there were people here before. Like, no, I'm sure some of them had thought about it. But, you know, like I think uh, in your Uncle Bruce being really smart in like directly quoting the Settler Invaders diaries. So it's like, you know, like you Can't might not argue. believe me, but <laughs> yeah, look at this. Um, and sort of, yeah, thinking about um, the land differently and thinking about, um, yeah, sort of the way that Aboriginal people used and use land um, and, uh, you know, having this relationship with the land pre colonization. Um, having all this sophisticated, you know, call it science, you know, like Aboriginal science, pre-colonisation. And so, yeah, I think white fellas rightly, um, yeah, were really um, interested in this work. Um, 
And, you know, that, that's a work that's, you know, travelled, you know, has international attention, has now a children's book version um, and also a Bangara interpretation. So, um, yeah, pretty sick. And I think that's what we'll see in the future. We'll see works living on just from the book. They'll then become movies, TV shows. Uh, it's already starting to happen. Um, but uh, I guess, you know, you see you know, you see a story that is so big that it can't be contained. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think um, Uncle Bruce's book's an example of that. Um, and so, yeah, it can change the way people think. Uh, it can empower um, young fellas to, like, see themselves on the page and be like, cool, um, I can, you know, I, I can have more confidence in myself and um, I can do the things that I want to do. Um, I'm not at a deficit because I'm Aboriginal. I actually come from this strength. I come from the oldest living culture in the world. Um, I can, you know, I can really be strong and proud. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's what these stories do and one story can't do everything that's why yeah again I say it's important that there's a lot of stories and a lot of diversity across the board. And something that is unique to young emerging writers today is social media digital Mm. age and how that's quite different so traditionally you know there would be critics that would speak about and we still have that somewhat but these days everyone's a critic aren't they? They can just hop online and say whatever they think about whatever, whether it's a book or what you're wearing that day. Um, what's your take on this uh, and its impact on young writers? Yeah, that's a really big question. You're right in that reviewing culture has changed massively. Um, no longer uh, like reviews, the, the thing that captures people's uh, opinions uh yeah online chatter and conversation has really and it's you know it's instant and it's really something that removes very quickly um I think that there's positives and negatives um I think it's great when black fellas can start a dialogue about black work um online in a way that can sort of cut out what was traditionally you had your white reviewer who, you know, gave it a thumbs up or a thumbs down. And white reviewers are still, they still have to step up to be able to, they're still a little bit behind in how to like critique our work um, because, yeah, they're so, it's, they, they don't get it, I guess, if that's, <laughs> that's my very sort of simple um, explanation. Um and uh, so it's good to have black blackfellas reviewing blackfella work, and that's something that does happen online. Uh, but of course, there's there's also uh, yeah, there's also like uh, I guess scary stuff that happens online too. Um, whether it's um, yeah, sort of I guess bullying or. Um, racial vilification or whether it's um unfortunately lateral violence um so yeah mob um attacking other mob and so unfortunately the online space which um is really is quite a capitalist space uh, it's really egocentric although it can provide beautiful uh, ways for us to continue the Murray grape, Grapevine, Kuru Grapevine, whatever, um, it can also play into um, the more sort of um, unfortunate um, aspects of community, yeah. Do you think it's important that young writers shield themselves from that a little bit? Yeah, just be very aware, you know. I think, um, you know, have, no, have a sort of a life offline that is, that's really grounding um just be aware that people faceless people can say things um that can be very hurtful and that they they can hide behind um an online persona um and that it's not everything you know like if if they they're not everything they're not everyone and 
and that there's yeah there's there's so much there's so much other places to to find belonging and to find community and and uh to sort of yeah find your people some great advice (laughs) there um just tell us about your new work now yeah i'm throat coming up i'm excited to say that i've got another book coming out next year called throat uh, which is a poetry collection uh it follows on from my previous work um some of the themes around country environment family belonging love um it's yeah it's really but I think it sort of takes it up a notch because um as a friend recently read it a white friend uh gave it to her to read it's just like oh ooh, this is yeah this is quite you know you're really going hard for it I was like yeah cool I'm glad I'm <laughs> glad you think so yeah <laughs> um yeah just uh yeah t- truth telling and um also like yeah a lot of humor um I think it yeah I think yeah I'm really proud of it and uh yeah I just hope I hope people are gonna like it um so yeah that's coming out May next year well, we're very excited and we're very proud of you for your contribution to this space already. It's Thank been you. a wonderful conversation and I could sit here for another hour and ask more questions. But I would like you to um, to wrap us up to offer any advice to any young Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people out there who might think that they want to be a writer. Firstly, I just want to say thanks so much for the support. So sweet. Our um, pleasure. It's been really great yarning. Um, I could stay here all day. Uh, all right, okay. Uh, so for the young ones out there or, yeah, no matter what age you are and you're wanting to start writing, um, uh, my advice for you would be to follow your heart um, and think about who um, are your elders and this could be... Um, you know older people or how we you know how we usually think of elders but this could also be people that have inspired you um other writers other creatives um that then you give you the permission to be like I can do this you know um people that you feel like yeah you know you're yeah you're really happy that they've created this and then you could sort of think about it as being a like a chain you know then you can create something that someone will also have an affinity to um so uh I would say um you know there's a lot of stuff out there about like building a writing practice um you know writing every day or whatever I would say that don't feel pressured um because with those things if you if you're too busy and you don't write you could feel very guilty and then that guilt can like stop you from continuing to write so um, I'd say know that like writing routines are often for people who have perfect lives they're for people for normally for like white men I guess who have other people that can do things for them um, you know if you have a really busy life um, just find the time to write when you can and really concentrate on the feelings that you feel when you write and you'll know when it feels good and then you'll know that you will want to return to that feeling um and yeah don't be ashamed to show other people you're writing and to then build connections with other writing and other writers and mob that are writing and uh yeah hopefully um we'll be seeing you you soon around the tracks um and we hope to be seeing you soon more events right around the traps and of course early next year when your novel comes out um we count sorry early next year when throat comes out we look forward to having a read of that but thank you very much for joining us on the reel and uh we'll be continuing to follow your success and all the very best cool thank you very much thank you
You've been listening to The Real podcast series. The Real is an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander digital media platform produced by 33 Creative. This episode was recorded in Sydney on Gadigal Country. Produced by Jake Keane and Marguerite Barbara. Music production by Jimbler. For more stories and podcasts, visit the-real.com.au forward slash podcast. 